Welcome, good morning. My name is Mabel van Oranje and I'm um, the chair of Girls Not Brides and I'm going to be the moderator of this amazing panel about, I think, one of the most important topics in the world, unleashing girls' power. And you know what? The Millennium Development Goals, which most of you know a lot about, um, we're, we're quite intriguing in that they seem to have forgotten that there's something like called a girl or an adolescent girl. And so a lot of them were focused on kids until a quite a young age. And then there was that hole in the middle. And then, you know, we picked the human being up again when it was 18 years old. And of course we know that's wrong. And luckily there is now more attention to the fact that girls not only do exist, but actually developing girls really makes sense. And the reason why that's so, and what we're gonna do about it, and how we're gonna make sure that these sustainable development goals that are de being developed now are gonna no longer ignore adolescent girls is the subject of this panel. But we're not just gonna talk about the UN and you know, sustainable development goals in a very abstract level, because we know that ultimately change happens on the ground. And that's why I'm delighted that we have four persons on the panel who know that better than pretty much anybody. And they are memory from Malawi, Malawi, an 18-year-old advocate who is standing up for girls' rights so incredibly powerfully um, through an organization called Let Girls Lead. And, and I was, you know, we've been talking, but I've also been reading some of the work that you've written, and there's a quote that I, I just love, and it says it all in a way. When you invest in a girl, she will not only change her own life, but the life of her family and her community. Memory, welcome. Then we have Rebecca Winthrop, who is the director and a senior fellow of the Center of Univer uh, Universal Education at Brookings. She's an expert on global education and uh, specifically knows a whole lot about, about that in the context of armed conflict. And she and I did a little bit of plotting yesterday around some education things. I must say, she has an amazing strategic mind. Next to her, Lucy Lake, the executive director from, uh, from, uh, of CAMFET an educational organization that is widely known and widely praised for its integrated approach, its empowerment of girls, and the smart ways in which you guys work together with governments. Um, and Lucy, you know, is also one of these wonder women that makes wonders happen. And then, Grasa Michelle, after everything that was said about you and everything you said yesterday at the Wonder Wall Award Ceremony, I don't think you need much of an introduction, but we're incredibly honored to have you here. We know that you are the most relentless advocate for girls and women, for development, and especially in Southern Africa. Thank you for joining us. And then, of course, there is that empty chair, because, look, all women, but we know that when you talk about unleashing the power of women, we can't do that without boys and men. We'll be discussing that, but we especially welcome any men in the audience today who feel they can contribute to the discussion to kind of take that seat and, and join us. Memory. The, what was the, f the moment in your life that made you decide that you wanted to stand up for the, for the, you know, the rights of girls? Um, the most moment that um, has taken me this far is when I think about the way how I grew up uh, in my community, Malawi, the southern part of Malawi, um, I grew up uh, in that environment uh, where we had a lot of traditions. A lot of the, all those traditions, by the end of the day, they were harming girls and um, stopping us to go to school. So in relation to all that, um, it's a personal experience uh, that happened um, within my family. I have um, a little sister, um, she is now 17. So um, she got pregnant when she was 11 years old. And you can imagine 11 years uh, old girl getting pr pregnant and she was so young, she couldn't do house calls uh, at home as a young girl. I was helping out, at least I was um, 13 by then. So when I saw that happening and when I related all that, um, things that were happening to my sister with the community is when um, it was a wake-up call for me. Uh, I was like, I saw these things happening from a distance and I didn't know that it mattered. I didn't know that I, was, uh, I would be affected. So when that happened, I was like, this doesn't have to happen anymore. 
So that was when I started actively getting involved, uh, ensuring that every girl, uh, not only in my community, but the people that surround me get uh, at least a better education. At least um, we talk to our traditional leaders that this is a wrong thing to do. So that's how I started getting involved little by little and uh, growing up within all that and making sure that girls, um, that was when, um, actually it was a year later, that was when um, a girl, um, an organization came in my community mm -hmm. that came with a stop child marriage campaign in my community. So I was like, this is the thing that I've been waiting for. So I joined the club and mobilized other girls to join the club. So we talked to our traditional leaders and actually my community was the first community where traditional leaders committed that we must have um, uh, laws just within our community that will protect girls. And later on, after that, other areas adopted the, th uh, the same uh, commitments where uh, they, they said that uh, no girl in our communities have to be married off by the age of 11, despite the major law, the supreme law, where they say 15 years old is the legal age. Mm -hmm. So it has been 15. a... 15? Yeah, 15 was the legal age uh, in Malawi, not until recently. Yeah, and we'll talk later about yeah. some of the changes that are happening, if yes. that's okay. But thanks for sharing that story. I, I think it's really remarkable if you think about it. Was it determination? Was it bad luck? Here you have two sisters, and one is here today on stage with us, and the other one has three children, is 17 years old and twice divorced. Um, so thanks for being with us, and thanks for the courage you have. Mrs. Michel, girls have been ignored for such a long time. Can you share your thoughts on why you think that was happening, but more importantly, why you think it's so important that we unleash that girl's power? I think we uh, all, as uh, international community, have been acting always as a second thought when it comes to women's issues and now girls. Let me be just a brief, brief reminder. You know, the Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1940. <laughs> Only in 75, the world woke up and reminded, oh, we forgot women. And then we had the Mexico Conference, you remember? Mm -hmm. And then after that, that's when we had Nairobi, we went to Beijing. But it, that was 30 years later when the Declaration on Human Rights had been adopted. In that process, then we were all focusing on women and women and women and women, including myself. Then we woke up and said, oh, but we forgot that before you become a woman, you are a girl. Let's go and deal with girls. And then we started girls and girls and girls and girls. And then we woke up and said, Oh, but it, you are a girl and then you are a woman. There's a gap in the middle here. It is the way we adopt agendas, which is wrong. We have to look at a human being in different stages. And you can adopt different strategies of how do you support a little girl, how do you support an adolescent, and how do you support a young woman and how do you support a woman or an elderly woman? But a human being is not cut in stages. And I'm saying this because in future, we really have to take attention to how in human rights family, we look at human beings in different stages and take them as a whole. So that's one of the reasons why it was forgotten. But the second question yours is, why we believe that at that stage you unleash uh, the power and the potential of a girl. You know, it is at that age where more than just being a child who is being cared for, who is being guided. Adolescents, they wake up and they have that sense of uh, everything is possible. They even believe they know everything. They can do everything. <laughs> That's the time they need much more guidance. And this is the time 
as Memory was saying, they discover the development of their body. Psychologically, they are really very powerful. And at the same time, they are confronted, at least in our part of the world. Mothers will not talk to them about sexuality, for instance, because it's a taboo. At community level, tradition doesn't allow you to talk about sexuality, particularly with girls. So they are left alone and they confront these questions and doubts and curiosity without a proper guidance. And that's why we have to come and say, working with families, because it's their responsibility, working with community leaders, changing traditions, harmful traditions, working with the religious leaders, and working with schools, schools. That's the time we need to have a combined action, which shouldn't be only us as human rights family. I'm insisting it's family, it's school, it's community, it's her church. Wherever she is, we need to have a combined action which gives them support, care, but allowing her to make choices. Thank you. Rebecca, um, yesterday afternoon, Grasso Michel said, girls' education is fundamental. Can, can you please, I mean, you do know so much about this, can you tell us a little bit of where are we on the issue of girls' education, especially adolescent girls' education? What is the status and are we making progress? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. It's not every day. I speak at a lot of conferences, but not every day with Grace Michelle on the panel, a global treasure and um, uh, someone who's certainly inspired my, me in, in my career. Um, so in terms of your questions, one about sort of the importance of girls' education, which you brought up, another about where are we at in, in the world on the education front for girls. Um, the first one, the importance of girls' education. Um, before I throw a few statistics at you, as we academics are wont to do, I'll just tell you a little story of how I got into the, the field of education. I was very early um, in my career, and I was working in Central America, uh, and I was working um, on legislation reform to support um, women who are affected by domestic violence. Um, and when I was talking, you know, sort of talking to um, women in the community about this legal reform, they said, you know, that's very nice, it's important, we like it, but if you really, really want to help us, could you please teach us how to read? Because we don't know how to read, and if we knew how to read, we could actually navigate by ourselves the health clinic and get some support we need, because we we're suffering in our households. We could get a job and earn some money on our own, and therefore we might be able to leave our husbands, we could support our our children, etc. So we've heard a lot about this in, in last night and, and in the conference about that ripple effect that girls' education has. Um, and indeed, that's what the, the evidence says. I'm sure it's familiar to most of you. Um, Larry Summers, who is a, a prominent economist, um, many years ago did a study and said, you know, girls' education is probably um, the most high return investment in the developing world. And indeed, it's true. You, people are probably familiar with the, the data that for every year of schooling, um, you get 10 or 20% increase um, in earnings for women. Although I have to say, in the, recent data shows that it's actually not really years of schooling that, that gets that. It's the quality of the, of the education and the skills you're learning. So it's better to have a girl for five years in a really good school learning something than eight years in a school where they don't learn much. Um, I'm sure people are also familiar with the data around increasing in, in uh, girls' education, really reducing uh, child mortality throughout the year. So anyways, there's lots of data. Um, but without, uh, one last thing I would say on that before doing the where are we at part is that, you know, a lot of times in our community we talk about girls' ed for its ripple effect, the return on investment, and that is incredibly important. There is a big bang for the buck, but I would argue that even if there wasn't a ripple effect, you should still invest in girls' education. You should invest in it because it helps the girl, just the way you invest in it because it helps boys. Um, and I have two boys, and I care about boys' education as we all do who are in the girls' ed movement. So I think that's something for us to remember as we go out in the world on this topic. Um, in terms of your second question, Mabel, about where are we at, um, we've actually made huge progress in girls' education, and I, and I think it's important um, to frame a little bit how that 
progress was made. Um, because if you think about it, it reminded me uh, some of the conversations in the panel yesterday on paradigm shift about mindset shift. And frankly, mass education is not a really um, long uh, idea that's been with us. 200 years ago, most of us in this room um, would have never suspected that our lives would be shaped by sitting in a classroom and schooling, nor our children's. Um, and you know, today, there's not a country in the world that doesn't have mass schooling. I can't imagine, I don't know if you, maybe there is, maybe you know, I can't imagine an election in the world where a president presidential candidate would stand up and say, and I'm running on a platform of half of the children in this country going to school. Uh, so there has been a massive mindset shift about basically uh, what Ms. Michelle said, that human, every child has a right to education. And that has boosted um, the gains in girls' education. And we have made huge strides in primary education enrollment. Um, so in 1990, um, this was a global problem. Girls were not enrolling in primary school the same rate as boys. 86 countries uh, only had sort of gender parity. Um, in 2012, 124 countries have gender parity, so it, it really is a huge gain. Um, but just as you said, Mabel, that is, um, we shouldn't stop there. There's lots of problems to come. And so I want to show you just three very quick slides to end off with about where we need to focus our attention now on girls' education. So if I could have the, the first slide. Here you see, and for our panelists, you can glance over there. The yellow is gender parity. The blue is actually boys are disadvantaged. And this is secondary school. This is secondary school. If you looked at primary school, it would mainly be yellow, the map. Um, and you'll see that there are hot spots in girls' education. There, the, dark, the dark red countries are where um, less than 85 girls per 100 boys enroll in secondary school and, and the slightly better in the, in the light pink. Um, but there's this band of countries between South Asia through the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa that are real hot spots. Um, and I wanted to show this because I often get the question, when pe people say, well, what about boys? Are you forgetting boys? And we in the girls' education mo movement certainly are not forgetting boys. Um, but that the, where boys are disadvantaged and where girls are disadvantaged are different parts of the globe, and they are fundamentally different issues. In Latin America, it has to do with gang violence and low quality and more um, economic opportunity for employment for boys and girls not having that, so boys leave school. And in, um, in the hot spots for girls' education, the red countries, it has a lot to do with a range of things, including child marriage. Could we get the second slide? Oh, actually, I think I have a clicker. I'm supposed to do this all by myself. Um, <laughs> you'll see this is a map of incidents of child marriage. And the big, big bubbles are where half the girls um, are married off before the age of 18. Um, and so it's the same band of countries you'll see through sort of Southwest Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa there. And then the last slide I want to show you in terms of the hot spots are these, the bright red countries are where girls are systematically attacked because they go to school. So we're all familiar with the Chibok girls in northern Nigeria and Malala in Pakistan, but there are 13 other countries around the world that, where this is systematically happening um, in, in, in rampant rates. So a similar band of countries as well. So that's really where we need to focus our attention for education. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I mean, these slides are, I think, absolutely amazing, and it makes you realize how, how all these things connect. Um, Lucy, you and Camford, all your colleagues in Camford, you, you're trying to, to address this on the ground. And, and Grasa Michelle just said, like, we, we need to stop looking at the girl, you know, in a siloed way. And one is give her education and the other one is giving her health care. So, so can you tell us a little bit about how you do this? I mean, how do you ultimately empower the girl and look at her as a whole and make sure that she develops? in all aspects that she needs to be developed. Thanks, Mabel. I think that's a, you know, the critical question. How do we get to programs that actually work for girls? And just quickly, I mean, what do we mean as CAMFED by actually working for girls? Firstly, I would say it's about um, ensuring that retention rates of girls through secondary school are above 90% for the most marginalized girls. It's about ensuring that those girls are achieving pass rates 10% above the national average. And it's about the delay in their age of marriage and motherhood. And in Malawi, 5% of girls who have been through school under CAMFED's programs 
have become mothers compared with 27% in the same age group. That's what working for girls means for us. And it's not just for hundreds of girls. It's not just for thousands of girls. It's for hundreds of thousands of girls. And so coming to the, to the how of this, it's not just a numbers game. It's not just about numbers of girls going through school. And it's not just about pushing up literacy and numeracy rates for girls. It's about engaging with the fundamental dynamics and economics that render girls vulnerable. Because this is about, um, if we're going to transform girls' prospects, then we need to transform their context. And we need to do so by recognising that girls' education sits at the intersect of three key things. It sits at the intersect of power, money, and sex. And we have to address all three if we're going to get the how right in girls' education. So first of all, power. As Mr. Michelle said, this is about bringing together all those in authority over girls' lives in order to explore and engage with the obstacles to girls' education and success. And this goes beyond the education system. This needs to involve the health system. It needs to involve the police, traditional leadership, and harnessing that collective power in order to be able to come up with the solutions to girls' education. Um, and secondly, money. For girls to go through secondary school, for the foreseeable future, there are going to be costs involved for families. And for the poorest families, those costs are beyond their means. And so how do we finance that? And we need to recognise as well that it's not just about finance, that families bring crucial resources to the table to enable girls' success, resources in shelter, in love and support for girls. And we have to bring together the finance and those resources to enable girls to succeed. But to do that, we have to bridge the gap between home and school and recognise that at secondary level, that gap is wide, both because the distance from home to school is much greater at secondary level and because the parents of girls in the most marginalised families in the poorest communities are themselves marginalised from the school system. Many of them have not been up to secondary level themselves and therefore they're disempowered in relation to that system. And that comes to my third point around sex because girls will take extraordinary risks to secure and retain their hold to go through secondary education. And that can involve transactional sex, sex in order to secure the money for their school-going costs. School fees in order to be able to live in accommodation near the school because the distance from home is so far. And that renders them highly vulnerable to pregnancy and then to drop out and into early marriage. And even when mechanisms do exist to address the issue of finance for girls' education and to bring through the resources for girls' school-going costs. If those are positioned wrongly, it can render girls more vulnerable. And if parents are disempowered in relation to the system, they can't reinforce accountability. And I always remember one young woman in Ghana who said, if you go to a school and you see that the most beautiful girl has the bursary, you have to ask yourself why. Most likely, it is because she is having sex with someone in authority. So we have to address this. We have to reinforce and get right the governance over the resources for girls' education. And if we get right that governance and accountability, that will be fundamental to achieving girls' education and well-being. It will be fundamental to achieving the full returns on girls' education. And it's fundamental to enabling us to scale action for girls' education. And I'll, I'll come back to that issue of scale. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Memory, you, you um, have been working very hard in the last month, years, um, on the issue of the, the age of marriage in Malawi. 50% uh, of all girls in Malawi are married by the time they, they hit the age of, of 18. And, um, and the good news is that you guys have been successful and the law has recently changed, raising the age, minimum age of child marriage, of marriage to, to 18. Can you tell us a little bit about like, now that we have this law, is that gonna make, you know, be it all? Or what, what is ahead? What do you think needs to happen to make sure that we get the, the prevalence rate of, of child marriage down to zero? Oh, thank you. Um, 
that's a very exciting news. Um, I would say um, it, it has been a very um, fierce battle, I should call it, because like um, it has been for almost 10 years where the bill would be, um, uh, would be in the parliament and then like they would refuse to debate on it and go back. Like this has been happening for, for, for years. And then with the um, connection that we had with the girls in our communities, with the help with the media and everybody, um, the bill actually passed in the parliament uh, in February. And I remember um, during those days where the, the day that they were debating, we had to stand the whole week at the door of the parliament. We stood there telling the parliament every, every time they go in, please support the bill, please support the bill. And the last day, we were like, okay, so what, what else can we do? We are like, okay, uh, what if we have SMS campaign. So we decided to get their numbers uh, through some journalists. So we texted them, support the bill, support the bill. When the bill passed in the parliament, we sent them back the text, thank you so much for supporting the bill. Mm. So it was a very connective, like a connective force of girls and um, other people uh, in, in Malawi. It was very beautiful. Um, And getting back to your question on what more needs to be done, I would, um, I would connect this with the way how not only Malawi has now a, a minimum age of 18 as, as a legal age for marriage, many other countries have this law. But if you see child marriage is still a problem, it's still a crisis that is hitting a lot of countries worldwide. So what I would say is, um, it's high time we look at child marriage issues as a crisis. It's, it's something that uh, needs to be prioritized, looked at closely. And uh, the bigger thing that uh, I know a lot of things have, um, have been happening, the we, we, uh, girls are getting a lot of support and it's, it's a very encouraging thing, but we need more of your support more support from the government, more support from um, uh, international um, organizations uh, and everywhere. By supporting girls, um, um, I'll go further in um, much more of supporting, I'll look at it as um, investing in girls. It's, that, that is the biggest support, investing in them directly. And uh, furthermore is, um, I was looking at it, um, creating more space for girls and that, that will be very remarkable because when we are in that special place, like in Malawi, we have a lot of girls' crabs. When we are there, we, we know because we have our stories. We know what is affecting us. They are not here, says they are our little stories. So when we share in our little presses, we, we, we know how can we present all this. So if safer presses are provided to girls and more of your support, you give us more of your support, I think that will be a tremendous thing that needs to be done. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mrs. Michelle, you have been a, an absolutely crucial um, uh, leader in, in the creation of this global movement to stand up and to make sure that we get a world to end child marriage together with, with your fellow elders and obviously in the creation of Girls Not Prides. Um, we know that when, when you try to change a social norm as sensitive as child marriage, that's very difficult because you're, you're dealing with tradition. Um, yes, it requires empowerment of girls, but empowering girls alone is probably not enough. You need to involve the fathers, the, the leaders in the community. Can you share your thoughts on, on how do we do this? Can traditions actually be changed? And, and how are we gonna do that? And, and what is the role of men in that process? Mm. Well, I remember when we were debating this within the elders and this idea of traditions are man-made and traditions can change and traditions must change. Mm -hmm. And your question is, how do we do this? I think we, 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 we have to do it in different levels, in different sectors. I will insist on family first. You know, every decision whether this child is going to be one, enrolled, second, 
retained to be in school until she completed primary education, and then to transit to secondary education. This is, at the end, a family decision. So many times we focus on institutions and we forget that at the end of the day is the father and the mother who have to make the decision of keeping their child in school, regardless of the financial and the economic challenges they face, they will keep this child in schools until she completes at least secondary, because then she's grown up enough to decide whether she wants to marry, whether she doesn't want to, and to make choices, etc. So families, and I'm insisting particularly with us activists that we should understand we go from family, then for community, and then, as I was saying, in schools, because the quality of education, the development of skills, the empowerment we're talking about, when school is properly organized, it's a huge source of really giving the, the foundations of this young child to be able to affirm, assert herself, and then even when they, they are social norms which are against her rights, then she can say, I know I can. That's what she's saying. That's what memory is saying. So, I think school is another level in which we should be focusing on. Then this, uh, in our part of the world, I believe in that map also you can confirm that, Tradition, traditional leaders. Mm -hmm. You need to sit down and really to explain to the traditional leaders that whoever who can praise himself of being a leader, even in traditional way, the first responsibility is protection of the people who are under his authority. And protection of girls, it's a his or her responsibility. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, but you need to sit with traditional leaders for them to understand this and to begin to take pride in saying, in my community, this is not going to happen. And they get out there and they will tell even parents, parents who decided to keep girls at home, if the tradition leader has made it, that decision will go out and say, in my area, this is not going to happen. They are very powerful in terms of influence. So traditional leaders have to be worked. And then you have the religious leaders. And it's not exactly the same thing. It's, it's, it's a different kind of context, although they are complementary. And you, work, you need to work with them also separately. In areas, for instance, where you have a, a FGM as a practice, you know, you need to sit with the women who are the cutters. Uh, they have different names in every country. But for them, to cut a girl is an economic issue because they're being paid for that. So you have to say to them, but you are, you are going to stop doing this, but you give an alternative of how she is going to make a living without cutting girls. I'm being too long, but I'm saying there are different elements of this. That's why at the end, just to try to be uh, short, in our approach, in our approach, you need to address them separately, but you bring them into an alliance. You can call it alliance, you can call it a part, but make them work together in which from gov government officials, from all the leaderships I have mentioned here, including families, they agree that they are going to stop a child marriage in their region. They are going to work together. You help them even to spell out the responsibilities of every kind of leadership which is involved, oh, stakeholders, if you like, <laughs> so that they know that they have a common goal, but they have specific responsibilities. And you build the alliance. This alliance, it's not going to happen through a meeting. You need a process in which you work with them until really they gel to work together. And then they have 
as you know, they have a plan in which they can say, well, in one year's time, two years' time, three years' time, five years' time, what we have to achieve. This is what we are trying to do. Yesterday, was it? No. Yes, yesterday I, I mentioned I mentioned Tanzania and I mentioned the, the I didn't say it, it's the Mara region where we are. It's it's precisely what we are doing. Even before we get into the curriculum, it's to build the alliance and give them the ownership of being them to drive a social change. And we say, then universities will come in, will help to develop, for instance, the baselines to say where we are today. And if we are to say where to be in five years time, we have to have baselines. <laughs> universities help on this. You need to establish the monitoring systems and universities can help on this and we engage the University of Dar es Salaam. And then you need to, 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 to also to ask the hard questions. What are the issues which are really fueling child marriage? It, you don't count those things, they're not measurable. They are deeply embedded, embedded in the way people think and somehow they believe, parents believe that they have a right to make decisions about their child without consulting them. They believe it's their right as parents. So when we say believes, we mean exactly that sense of entitlement to say, she is nine, she is 10, I will give her a way to get married. With which right? Simply because you are a parent? No, and you need to change this. But in every community, even in one country, there are no single elements which influence child marriage. They are different. Mm -hmm. So universities have to be brought in to help us to research. Don't generalize. Maybe this is the wisdom of age which came with me because I was also very easy to generalize things. And now I came to understand, no, 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 you don't do it that way. You need to understand the community you are going to be working in. In one district, you may have different ways of looking at the same, the same issue. And when you understand it deeply, then you'll be able to say, what are the underlining factors which are, I mean, fueling this. And while you are dealing with what you can count, what you can say it's happening in school, et cetera, et cetera. But you help people to change the mindset. And that's what we mean. Traditions can change and traditions must change. So it's a huge thing. And I agree with you. It's not about the numbers. We need the numbers. We need the numbers, definitely. But you know what? In some communities I have been, highly educated women, they don't find it being a problem to be in a polygamous marriage. It's fine. But other people will say, polygamous marriage? Why I would share my husband with other two, three women? So education, even skilled women, sometimes it's not sufficient for them to take control to the point where they say, uh-uh, I'm not going to allow myself to do this. So, I'm not minimizing the importance of education. I'm saying if we don't go and understand the other underlining factors, which can be called traditional or whatever, I hate to call them cultural, because I don't think culture in any place is oppressive. Culture always elevates all of us. That's culture. But the traditions, yes. Tradition can be oppressive, and they are oppressive. So, I'm just trying to say that it's a long walk we have together. We at Elders, we have decided that we are going to engage on this and try to change in a generation. And you mean, you know what it means, a generation? It means at least 30 years. We as Elders, we are not going to live 30 years because we are all old. But what we want is to lay the foundations to make sure that memory, and others will take up in a much more solid, I mean, standing and setting to change exactly those traditions. So I'm saying this because also in the development community, we tend to change agendas very easily. You know, five years ago, child marriage was not in the agenda. 
It happened because there was a huge campaign of civil society organizations in which even us as elders were engaged. And don't be surprised, in five years' time, if someone comes with a brilliant idea and they move out of child marriage. I want to say, those who have pledged to work with child marriage, they have to be prepared to work for the next 30, 45 years. Mm -hmm. Not changing ad uh, uh, agendas easily, because this is not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. It's not a quick fix. So I was too long, but trying to, yes, I, I know I was, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was too long, but trying to say, as we have, for instance, here, uh, 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 acad academics, please help us to understand. Wherever you are working, try to research, go deep, ask the hard questions, because it's not only about money. It's, not only, it's about lots of other things which are under. What are they? And how do we deal with them? Give us, I mean, inputs for those. While we are dealing with those things which we know, we can measure, and effectively, they have proven somehow a certain degree of effectiveness. But it, it's a complex, and it's a long, and it's more than sustainable of 15 years, but it's more than 15 years of sustainable development goals we are talking about. Rebecca. I don't think I need to say anything. <laughs> you do. You do. You do. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca. Oh. Ditto. It's sorry. very clear. It, it's going to take more than 15 years. But, but at the same time, the world at the moment is focused on this. What is the development agenda for the coming 15 years? And so there's now 169 targets. I mean, whew. if you had to choose something, in your field, education, what would you say, let's focus on that, this is going to be catalytic, this is really going to make a difference? Right, right. Um, so that's a, a really good question, and there's two things that I um, think are very parallel, because of course child marriage and education are mm -hmm. deeply embedded in communities, but also in terms of the movements. Mm -hmm. um, and one is that I think it's incredibly important, and we've <laughs> seen it in the success of the girls' education movement to date, um, that there is some sort of shared vision, mm -hmm. and you're going to ask me what that is in a moment, but I want to reinforce the point, um, that uh, there was a really shared vision around enrolling girls and boys in equal numbers in primary school. Mm -hmm. People had lots of different other things they were doing, always on the ground, but everybody had that as a piece of their agenda, and that's why we made so much progress on girls' education. Um, and so now, when it comes to, you know, well, what should that vision be now, today, um, as we're looking forward and we're building off the progress on, on primary education, um, I think it's really important to emphasize that we still need a shared agenda around girls' education. Um, and we've done a lot of work with it at, at Brookings at the Center for Universal Education with lots and lots of actors, many of you in the room, Lucy and, and many others, about, well, what should that shared agenda be? Um, and we, what we've come up with is sort of a, a broad vision with five, what we're calling second generation girls' education issues. Um, because for the pr precise point that Ms. Michelle said, primary education enrollment was a much more simple problem to solve. We are now in the terrain of hard stuff much more complicated. So the first point was we still need a shared agenda. The second point is, you know, what could that be? Um, the, the effort that people are mobilizing around now is a shared vision around girls, all of them leaving secondary education or its equivalent, it doesn't have to be a formal school per se, secondary education with the skills they need for their lives and their livelihoods. Um, and that is a really important shift. Um, and, I wanna, and I wanna pause there for a second before I talk about these five second generation issues that people have said are the important steps to get to that vision for you know, our next couple decades. Um, and just emphasize, because I, I, I was um, totally agree with your point about sort of the flash mob approach in international development. Um, I, use, I liken it to sort of children's soccer game. I don't know if any of you have kids. I have two little boys and they're playing soccer and all the kids run towards the ball and then the ball goes over there and they all run over there. And that's kind of, not anybody in this room of course, but funders out there. Um, 
have the same approach, uh, certainly in education and, and girls' education. So one thing when I, so what I've noticed, when we, there's an important sh um, nuance between saying we want our girls to leave secondary ed with the skills they need and saying we are going to only fund secondary education. Because in, the, in that map with the red hotspots, the reason those girls are not in secondary education is because they're dropping out of primary. So I don't want funders to think, oh good, I'm, not, I'm gonna stop funding primary, I'm going to just fund secondary. What they need to do is follow them all the way through, finish the job, basically. So um, what are the five issues? And then I'll stop there. The five sort of second generation issues that in the girls' education community at the global level, people are coming around a shared agenda is one, get girls into, get girls into the school and make sure, access. Number one is access. Get them in and make sure they, they, they go all the way through secondary. The second is safety. And, and it's both those attacks on education that, that you saw in, the, in those 13 countries where, where girls are actively um, bombed, kidnapped, et cetera, but also the type of sexual abuse that, that Lucy talked about in, 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 um, in and around to and from schools. Um, so safety is the second one. The third one is quality learning. And this is really a boys and girls issue. You can't lift lift the boat for girls only, you've got to do it for the whole system. Um, but it's incredibly important because a lot of girls are getting into school and staying for multiple years, but they're not graduating because they're not mastering the basic skills the year before. Um, and the fourth one is transitions, because we do need to start thinking out ahead. There are countries in the world that are, girls are getting through secondary education, but they aren't able to make the next step. Some countries in the Middle East are, are perfect examples. Uh, Jordan has a much higher um, uh, graduation rate out of high school of, of girls, and they really trump boys on their exams, and they, don't, they can't make the switch to the labor market. Only 18% of, uh, of women are, are working with, versus 60 or something of, of men. And that's not specifically an education system issue, but it is an issue that the education system has got to start grappling with and thinking about transitions, so that fourth one, transitions. And the fifth one is a how to get to the top four, and it's really um, underscores exactly what Mrs. Michelle just said. <laughs> and the fifth one is we have to lean in big time, this time around, to supporting developing country girls' education leaders. Because those big top four issues, they really are the big buckets that you need to tackle in those girls' ed hotspots, but the actual solutions to how you tackle access or safety, it looks really different in India than it does in Nigeria. So though, and the, where girls' education has made massive progress, it's in, in the last two decades, it's been where you've had to remove one barrier only. And so the hotspots, there's multiple barriers to address. So you need a very contextualized mm -hmm. understanding. And you can really only get that, not by piloting in um, and some sort of broad statements, but by really empowering developing country girls ed leaders, men and women, who exactly know in their communities how you've got to approach it. So that would be the big agenda. And I would say, lastly, maybe I'm being too long oh, too. No. Lastly, um, if people are interested um, in joining girls ed movement, they should join up with others. Do not start, start something by all means. This is, my God, this is Skull Forum. Start something, you know, social entrepreneurs. Um, but join, join up with others in a network because I, the last two years even, I have seen more global interest and momentum around the girls education issue and I've been working on it for 20 years than I've seen in a couple decades. Um, and there are active networks being formed with very senior leaders connecting to developing country leaders and it would be good if we could all come together. I completely agree with that. I've seen the power in Goals No Brides of what happens when you really work together. And um, so, yes, definitely. Um, Lucy, numbers do matter and don't matter. Um, you guys are reaching out to, to hundreds of thousands of girls, um, but that's still not enough. And, and now, not talking specifically about comfort, but in general, how do we get to skill while at the same time we work, like, like Memory and Mrs. Michelle reminded us, the work ultimately has to happen in the community. So. How do we scale it all up? How do we scale? And that, I think, was the key question that Ophelia Dahl raised in the opening plenary, is the, the critical question facing many of those activists and entrepreneurs at this forum. And I think, just coming back to what we were discussing, what's been discussed just now, that we, we do have to get the fundamental principles right, first and foremost, in how we're tackling the fundamental 
economics and dynamics that are pushing girls out from the school system before they're able to progress through. So I think getting those principles right is absolutely critical and dealing with that intersect of power, sex and money in order to enable girls to go through successfully. But I think when it comes to scale, one of the things we have to do is we have to engage with government school systems. And I know that many people see that government school systems are not the answer because of the bureaucracy and because they see that they don't house and incubate innovation. But I would say that it is through the government school systems that we will be able to embed scale for the long term. And the way that we can get around some of those issues is precisely because through engaging with communities. And the way, and one of the critical issues to do that is to ensure that we are putting into communities' hands the data in a way that will empower them to make demands on the system in order to leapfrog that bureaucracy and in order to disrupt the status quo. So I think the way that we put data into the hands of communities to be able to make demands on the system is critical on the one hand. But I also think that, that government school systems can, can house innovation. And that's one thing that we've done at CAMFED is bring in the private sector, bring in the social enterprises in order to be able to come up with those innovations that can tackle issues around education quality and around transition of girls on from secondary school. And so government school systems can house that innovation and it's through the communities that we can get that diffusion of innovation spreading like wildfire. And I think if you get the how right, then you have another extraordinary opportunity for scale. And we at CAMFED are seeing that in the network of young women who have completed secondary school with our support and who are now among the first educated young women in their communities. They number 33,000 today, but that's growing to 130,000 over the next few years. And the way in which they are joining up together not just among themselves, but in partnership with local authorities, because those local authorities have been engaged in their education and have a vested interest in those girls' success. And so those young women are now taking the reins of what's possible to achieve for girls in their communities. And so, you know, we're seeing, for example, last year alone, those, those young women, with, together with their communities, supported more than 263,000 children to go to school. That's over and above the children that CAMFED is supporting. Mm. And so that's when you have an extraordinary multiplier effect. And that's why we at CAMFED have set ourselves the goal over the next few years to support one million of the most marginalized girls through secondary school and into a secure livelihood in order to show the world just what it is possible to achieve at pace and at scale for girls, not with a big organization, because it's what that organization can mobilize in terms of the new, the new generation of entrepreneurs, activists, and philanthropists. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. I think... I think Comfed is one of the, the best examples I have come mm. across with in terms of approach. But it, Lucy, you just mentioned one thing which is very important for us to remember here. One of the reasons why we didn't, in some countries we don't uh, reach 100% of enrollment of girls, it's because they are in extremely challenged circumstances mm -hmm. where the, 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 the business as usual doesn't work. So when you talk of innovation and the different ways of approach, I think in every country we should ask the questions. Why, for instance, for five years, this country has managed to get 98% of girls to be enrolled, but there is 2% out. Where are they? Who are they? Why? And that is very important because in the line of leaving no one behind, those 2% which are out, they have to be brought into the system. And there are specific reasons why they are not there. So in every country, I would urge that we look at, is it because of conflict? Is it because of nomadic uh, circumstances? Is it because of extreme poverty? There are reasons why we fail to, 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 to get 
all girls enrolled. And sometimes we are too happy because the numbers have increased and we leave these ones behind. So I'm just raising these points in terms, and this is one. The second, it's in the map, which Rebecca has, uh, has shown us, some of the countries are countries in conflict. The strategies you are going to use in those countries have to be different from a country at peace. So while we are planning, while we are pledging, while we are really, I mean, engaging ourselves, we have to take time to understand those who are very much in the margin within a country in peace and to take specific, very specific strategies for countries which are challenged by conflict. You know it is my passion, it has been. <laughs> so it's, it's simply to, to remind ourselves that the major uh, guiding principles of the next generation of sustainable development goals as we are talking is leave no one behind. And it means they are girls who are left behind even in those countries which are doing relatively well. And we need to understand that the circumstances and the reasons why they are not within the system and make sure that if you have to adopt a specific strategy for them, please do. Good point. Mm. I, I, will, I would like to, to open it up and allow all of you to make comments, ask questions. But before doing that, I just want to see memory, listening to all this. Is there anything at this stage that you want to add to the conversation? Um, yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so um, I, I wanted to say that um, with the great work, the amazing work that is already being done, I wanted to relate this um, with my community, Malawi. I wanted to say that, um, um, you know how like, I, I always say that girls, um, if we are to change things around us, if we are to achieve the goal of women empowerment, girls-centered advocacy is very important. And it has, um, we have to think of ways on how we can embrace that and adopt that um, all over. And the other thing that in my country I think has always been left out is the involvement of men. Like, um, I remember, yeah. I remember um, during the, when, when the president signed the bill and one of the main, uh, co the comment that came from men was like, too much men, uh, too much women, things going on around here. And <laughs> there was something like, the bill, actually uh, the bill got delayed to pass because um, um, people were giving in, like there were a lot of controversies uh, on the bill. Men were like, this bill is disempowering a man. You know, but then like I was like, wait a minute. Think of how long a woman then has been disempowered all these years. If you talk about the bill that if, if it is disempowering a man, so it's, it's that area where you, you we, we have to think about how can we incorporate men as uh, as arrays, you know, not as enemies. Because by the end of the day, I, I am in college right now. But then if if we talk about girls stuff, let's say if we have girls clubs and anything you will not see a man in that, in that club. So how can we embrace that thing? How can we involve men? How we, can we make this little boy growing up and thinking of, oh, we are all equal? So, yes. yes. Mm. Right. Now, we have about 15 minutes left, and so I would like to suggest that we take two or three maybe four comments or questions at a time. Please, especially when you have a comment, keep it brief. Don't forget to introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll see who from the panel wants to react. And I want to make sure that at the end we have time for each of you to, to make a short final comment. The gentleman there. There's, oh, there's, a, there's a man called Jeff Skoll who wants to ask a question. Let's give him the... Jeff. Uh, uh, th thank you. Well, uh, no, I... If, if everyone can hear me, it's, it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, fantastic panel, uh, incredible comments. Uh, I, I'm going to make a quick comment and then ask a question. Uh, the quick comment is about movements and how uh, civil rights movements, whether it's uh, um, 
women's vote in the Western world, whether it's uh, anti-slavery in uh, the US, um, the overthrow of apartheid, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the Gandhian movement in, in India. Th these are things that took a long time but eventually reached the tipping point. And I believe with the uh, attention that the world is spending on this issue now, girls' education, girls' empowerment, that we're on the brink of a tipping point. The question is we now have an opportunity. Um, I mentioned this film on Malala and trying to build a global movement around girls' education. Uh, there are many uh, social entrepreneurs in this room uh, including uh, Lucy, uh, who represent uh, hundreds of millions of girls in the developing world. Um, if we were to wave a magic wand and have a wish list of what we want to accomplish in the next year mm -hmm. to see that all of this happens, what would we do? Mm. <coughs> For the next year, one year. Yeah, one year. Yeah, one yeah. year, okay. We'll take two more comments and then we'll get to this answer. Yeah. Please, the, I'm sorry, the gentleman. Thank you for a great panel. My name is Josh Goldstein from the Center for Financial Inclusion at Axion. I work specifically on making sure financial service providers are disability friendly and inclusive. So my question is, 15% uh, of the global population are people with disabilities. Little girls with disabilities are the most marginalized, most kept out of the educational system, often hidden away by their families. So my question is to all of you working on little girls' education, are you actively pursuing the goal of creating accessible schools so a little girl in wheelchair can come to school and, ha and go to the bathroom which is accessible to her? Are, disability causes poverty, poverty causes disability. Is that one of your priorities in trying to integrate little girls with disabilities into schools? Because I think it really should be. And, we, and, and the, uh, on the other end, we're trying to uh, create livelihood opportunities for persons with disabilities, but if they don't get education, then it may, becomes much harder. So I, I'm just hoping that you'll, maybe you are, but if you're not, think about prioritizing Absolutely. using the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities maybe as a springboard. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. And could you pause the microphone to the gentleman in front of you with us? I'm sorry, I'm going to try to remember where the hands are, but it's a little... Okay, hard. my name is Asan Jamil, and I'm from the Yemen Foundation out of Pakistan. Um, I wanted to make one comment and one question. I'm following Jeff. Just keep them short. Okay, so I, I think your, your uh, comment, uh, memory, about uh, including men, and I think the comment is that men actually cannot be happy if women are unhappy, and even the existing you know, extra power that they seem to have is not really an equilibrium state. So I think it's very important to get them involved because it's also their empowerment in there. Uh, the question I had was, you know, with respect to talking about family, you know, uh, Marcia, you talked about how it's very important to get the family uh, to understand the importance of education for their girls. And I'm just wondering whether you know, the zero to three early childhood education agenda actually speaks to that because parents are your first teachers. And when we're focusing on eventually holistically girls and then boys, wouldn't it be important for us to be working at early childhood education where parents are, you know, co-education, um, co-parenting is part of education like to hear your comments on okay. Could you pass the microphone to the lady in red, two seats next to you, thank you. And then we'll cut back to you. Thank you. My name is Musimbi Kanyor, I'm the CEO of the Global Fund for Women. I have a question regarding scale and, and areas of conflict, because they don't go together. Because where there's conflict, governments don't work. And where there's conflicts, you can hardly get. I, f I feel like if we need to address scale, we need actually to address also that question about those areas where the, there's conflict. And my second question, which I think is something that didn't really come out, but I know that it's very significant. I am very proud of Gannett, the organization that, um, uh, um, that, uh, that um, 
the lady comes from. Memory. <laughs> yes, memory comes from. But the reason that change came was because women in that area, organized as movements, have been working for ages. And I know it because we've worked under Camp and Gennett for many, many years to get where they are. I did not hear a mention of the role of women's movement in changing communities and keeping, keeping active on what needs to be done for years on end. Thank you. Um, there we go. Disabilities, the early uh, parenting agenda, conflict and skill, role of women's movement, but most importantly, Jeff's wish list. Well, I, can, I can answer part of uh, what I was saying when in each situation you have to identify who are these children who are out. I failed to mention children with disability, but it was back in my mind. It is precisely some of the groups of children who are not into the system are children living with the, with the, with the disability. And the reason why, again, I insist on family, and it has been quite clearly mentioned here, is because in some communities, are the parents with a child with disability who hide the children? And when you enter, and you don't end, end up only in the community hall, but you go family by family, that's where you are going to identify them, work with the families and encourage them to bring them into the system. I know that there are some countries which are trying to uh, have this concept of uh, inclusive school in which even children with disability attend a normal classroom, but they are attended differently to support them because of disability itself. But it's, it's, it's really a challenge. It's still a very early stage. You can't say there is massively a movement in which children with disability in, particularly in the developed world, it's being done. So thank you for the comment. I think it should be, we should t take note of that. <coughs> Women's movement. There's no doubt. I mean, uh, when I was mentioning about the different groups we have to bring in, I mentioned the women who they themselves are part of, uh, you know, of the system which oppress women. I didn't talk of the huge movement of positive change which women are. And there's no doubt, I mean, part of my life, it has been precisely in supporting uh, uh, the building of women's movements in different, in different sectors, oh, if you can like. You know, I could go and, for instance, we made a huge, well, significant, not huge. We made significant uh, development in political leadership. It was women's movements who have done that. But we haven't done enough when it comes to economic advancement of women, for instance. It's very little. Those who succeed economically, they're just token. Most of women are grounding in the so-called informal sector, and there is very little of strategies of how do you bring them into the formal economy and how they take a stake, a significant stake in the economy of our countries. So part of the things which we are doing in my very small organization is precisely to focus on economic advancement as a complement to political and other kind of empowerment we have been talking about. So yes, just to agree that women's movement are crucial at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's us as mothers again in the family who have to build this sense of equality between a girl and a boy from the beginning, even before they go to school. So when women uh, change the mindset and they don't value a, a boy more than a girl, or sometimes they're not too shy to stand up for the girls, when women get to that point, yes, a social change will have been rooted, I believe. So point taken. Mm -hmm. I, I, I need to, to leave other other, other <laughs> stuff. But Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked what, what could be in one year. My answer, it would be if all of us would focus on building or strengthening the movement, keeping it really very high in the agenda, not only global, but at the regional, I'm saying I'll use my continent 
at African, for instance, but at regional, Latin, all of us, to put on the agenda in one year to make sure that it's global, it's regional, it's national, it's subnational. Because only national, it's not enough. It has to go to provinces, to districts, etc., etc. To set the movement at the right place, if we could succeed to do that in one year, then we would say the next steps will follow. That's my suggestion. Good plan. Rebecca, you want to come in? Yes, I wanted to, to follow up on and, Ms. And Michelle. actually, you might have to make them very brief. Closing remarks yes, at the same time. Perfect. It's that's close fine. already. I'm happy to close. <laughs> that's what you <laughs> think. <laughs> Happy to close, and I want to answer Jeff's questions because it's it's something I've been mulling over um, for the last couple of years. But being being here um, at the Skull Forum this week has crystallized it in my mind. So two very concrete things that I think would be great um, over the next year. Um, one is sort of a broader point and an action around bringing two different paradigms and movements together. And another is a very sort of concrete mechanism that I think we should try to work towards. So the first broader point, what I have observed in the girls' education space um, is that you have girls' education people over here with education people who, and I'm one of them so I can talk about them this way, are kind of boring, are not very sexy in how they talk about things, and um, are very focused on a paradigm of government, big grants, sort of in infrastructure, Th that's the feeling. Um, not, and then you have um, sort of the girls' rights movement, and um, never the, and, and here I, I put this, the Skull Forum folks, frankly, where it's about social entrepreneurship, it's about um, disruption, it's about innovation, and frankly, never the two shall meet, almost. And, and, and it's crystallized in my head here. I'm not sure if girls' education has been a strong theme here at the Skull Forum over the years. I, maybe I'm missing something. Um, but I can certainly verify that in the girls' education space, the, the theories about mindset change, pattern, pattern change, new forms of leadership, new ways of doing things are not, are not pr prevalent and not prominent. What we know about is what girls need to change. You know, to, we know about girls' ed stuff through and through, but there's a lot that can be done if you could bring those two groups together and sort of infuse sort of the social entrepreneurship theories and energy into the girls' ed movement and at the same time, make sure that the social entrepreneurs um, and, and th that those approaches are really well informed and all the sort of data and science and good practice that we know about girls' education. I do also see social entrepreneurs sort of going off, starting stuff. I'm like, oh my God, did you know that seven other people just did that in a country across the way? You know, so, so I think there's a lot of benefit. So whether I, you know, concrete ideas, a global conference, bringing those two groups together. A second concrete idea, um, I do think, and I totally agree with you that, as I said before, I think the moment is now for girls' education. I have never seen so much attention. We're, we're working very closely um, at Brookings with uh, Hillary Clinton on a girls' charge initiative. We just worked with Michelle Obama, Obama on a let girls learn initiative. I'm running over this afternoon to the UK DFID government because they're starting another thing. And, I, and Norway in July is gonna launch another thing. So at a global level, I think we should all work together. And one thing that I think would be useful um, is if we got some global mechanism, um, per, we were talking about this before, some sort of global mechanism, a global fund or something, to find funds to channel to social entrepreneurs, developing country social entrepreneurs who have some proven model that they can scale. I can guarantee you, because I've been studying this for the last couple of years, there is a market failure for that niche. You have wonderful groups like the Global Fund for Women and Global Fund for Children, but there are very few who give very, very small grants, community-based work. Then you have big, big donors who will never fund the developing country local NGO. They, because they, mm. they're just set up to not do it, basically. I don't get me started. Um, <laughs> but there is not, you know, there is not a mechanism really to sort of get to those groups. Many of them are, are there. It was wonderful that Educate a Child got recognized, who can scale. And they're the ones who are working in those red countries, those hotspots, um, who know the context. And, and if we really can focus our energies on building them up, then I think we could do a really good job on the field. Thank you, Rebecca. Very clear. Lucy. OK, well, just to pick up quickly on the questions and then come to a, a final point. Um, so I think on the issue of disability, yes, 
I think it is about making those who are invisible visible and getting the processes right around finding those children who are invisible and bringing them into the centre is absolutely critical. And I think by doing that for the most marginalised girls, it opens up eyes to who else is marginalised and invisible. And yes, disabled girls are at the bottom of the pile in that respect. And Jeff, um, to your question, you said in the opening plenary that girls' education is the silver bullet in terms of what it can achieve around uh, child and maternal mortality, around climate change, around economic development. Well, I actually also think that girls' education in how we deliver it can be the silver bullet for international development. Because I think we can find new ways to deliver international development through girls' education that can, transform, can be transformative beyond the issue of girls' education. And I would just challenge you to put technology and finance into the hands of the CAMA network of 130,000 in a year and watch the incredible <laughs> transformation that can happen within a very short period. But just on a, on, a, on a final note, I said at the beginning that if we're going to transform girls' prospects, then we need to transform their context. But I would also turn that around and say if we're going to transform girls' context, then we need to transform girls' prospects. And coming back to Malawi memory, more than 20 years ago, I was in a court case in Malawi as a victim of a crime of serious gender violence. And the magistrate in that court case wrote that crime off and said that it was down to the high spirits of young men. Now, I came to terms with that eventually because I recognised that there were no women in that justice system. And if you took a step back, there were no women in the education system. And if you took another step back, there were no girls coming through the school system. And so that's why I joined Anne in CAMFET, because we have to start by getting girls through the school system, because it's only then that we will get women in the education system and women in the justice system. So we need to see girls' education just as the starting point for social change. Memory, what would be on, on your wish list for the coming year? Oh. <laughs> you can say whatever else you want to answer. Okay, great. Um, wow, I envision a lot of things. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, has always kept me going, fighting, and just, it's, it's a dream that is not just a dream. It's a dream that will be a reality. So when I see all the things that the collective tools that they have explained and everything, I see a future, a very bright future for every girl, not only in Malawi, but around the world. And with all these strategies put in place, it's where we say we have all the goals, we have all the targets. It's where we can say that it is possible indeed to achieve gender equality. So this is the moment where when I sit in front of the people and when I see the future, I see the tomorrow that is coming, I see that being realized. So, yes. <laughs> and I'm going to give the final word to you, yeah. Mrs. Marshall. You inspire us all. You are a role model for us. You, you, we learn from you. You, you give us hope. I, I, I think I have. I've been talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, let let me let me put put it this way. For me. Uh, investing in girls' education is a sort of a, a closing a circle of life. It's like uh, going back to recognize that like a tree, when you want to plant a tree, you begin by preparing the soil, you fertilize it, you water, and then you put the tree, 
you'll continue to water and to care for it. While it's small, there's a different kind of curve. When it gets a little bit, you prune it, etc. but you continue, you continue, I mean, to care for this tree and you look after it. This tree will not give you fruits immediately. It will take its time, but the way you care for it, it is the promise of the kind of fruits you are going to get in a certain period of time. While we are talking of this, we are breaking a circle. We are planning and building new generations of women who are not going to be like us, be talking of the kind of limitations and constraints we have grown in. We want even more than memory. I think I'll take the image of uh, uh, Jeff's daughter, maybe starting my granddaughter, that children, girls of today, if we are really committed in changing this, these are the future of you and I, being here or not, in next generations, we'll be talking of women's rights in a completely different, different level. So this is the commitment we're making here. And we really have to understand there's no meaningful social change without pr pruning and supporting these children. They are the future of just societies, equal societies, inclusive societies. If we are serious about that, that's the future we are building. They are the investment. And those who are entrepreneurs, they understand the concept of investing. You put resources here, but you'll get them later. So this investment, it's much broader. It's exactly by caring, inclusive, just, and you name it, the societies where a human being, men and women, we look shoulder to shoulder, value each other and respect each other. That's what we are trying to do with girls' education. We need a movement, and I would invite everybody who wants to be part of the movement and is willing to make the commitment to empower girls, to unleash their power, to now stand up and shake hands or hug the person next to you who's part of that same movement. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.